Hello everyone, here we are again, and this is the end of the marathon today for, for me and, and actually for all of you because I still recognize a lot of faces, and as much as, I, as I'm personally tired from this being my fifth presentation today, I know that it's kind of exhausting to, to listen to all of this all day, so I really thank you for the dedication. Uh, hopefully, you've been following along and you've been enjoying what you've, you've been talking about, if you haven't. I don't know why you're still here, but you know you can you can let me know what you would have done differently, what we, you would like to see instead. Always o always open for feedback, and again, I thank you. Uh, so I've been talking all day. I I have five presentations that I've done today, and they're all part of this series that I want to to kind of use in conjunction. And I had briefly mentioned it earlier, but if if you know honestly, I caught it late in the game, I would have liked to do this presentation before the leverage one and before the, the, the trading majors during active hours one because I think it's a more logical progression of thought all the same. I think this is great information and it fits in with what, a lot what, we, what we've been talking about. If you are tired of the RSI strategy, I'd suggest leaving now because we're going to talk about it more. But on a serious note, I think you know, again, I, I keep on talking about the same strategy, and maybe I'm beating a horse to death, but I do think it's a good proxy, and it gives us good information that we can actually use in our trading. Same disclaimer. The disclaimer hasn't changed, and it's just as significant as the first time. This is risky. When you're trading with leverage, you stand to lose a lot of money. Obviously, you can win a lot of money, but first and foremost, you should be aware that if you're trading with leverage, be aware that you should be trading with risk capital, capital that you can afford to lose. I'll be showing hypothetical performance. This is always made with the benefit of hindsight. I truly believe in the, th the things that I'm talking about. I wouldn't be saying them otherwise, but at the same time, you know, even if I really believe in it, it doesn't mean that the system that I think makes a lot of sense will work in the future, so please keep that firmly in mind. I think through our earlier presentations, we, we made that really clear. Something that works really well won't necessarily work really well forever and could actually see fairly substantial declines. So this is a chart that you're probably familiar with at this point. The same chart, the thir 13 of the most popular currency pairs and how profitable traders are on a quarterly basis. So the vertical bar shows you how many traders that traded that currency pair made money in that currency pair in a specific quarter. And the dotted line is the 50% mark. So if that bar is below 50%, that means that there are more traders that lost money than actually made money, which is really disappointing because at the end of the day, we want to make money. If you're in this just for the thrill of it, again, casino's right there, you get free cocktails. You're in this to make money. If the majority of the traders are actually losing, you really want to know why they're losing and how you can actually use this essentially to improve your own trading. Now, this is a really interesting chart, and I would shown it earlier, but I, I think this really bears repeating. And when you really dig into the data, I mean, the, the quarterly profitability data is, is pretty damning, for, for lack of a better term. I mean, a lot of traders lose money in, in, in Forex. But if you look at the finer details, if you look at you know, the tea leaves, so to speak, you see that actually there are specific times of day when traders, on average, are making money. Now, this data is useful uh, in, in isolation. I mean, it's nice to know that, for the most part, traders actually tend to do pretty well between the hours of 0 and, and 6 a.m. Eastern time. These are, so to explain this chart, putting the cart in front of the horse a little bit, apologize. This chart shows the percentage of traders that make money while holding a position in that specific currency pair per hour of the day in New York time. So. We see in this chart that, for example, the dotted line is, again, 50%. So if that, that dot is above 50%, more traders made money in that pair than lost through that specific hour. How do you reconcile that data, that data with the earlier? Well, you see that for most of the day, most traders are losing money. 
But the fact that there are those hours in which traders tend to do pretty well is pretty significant. And again, this, this data is interesting in isolation. I could tell you, OK, avoid this hour. But unless you know why traders are doing poorly during those hours, it's not that useful. I mean, it, if you want to go strictly by luck, I guess you could explain it that way. I don't think it's, it's purely luck, though. I think there's, there's something to this. And what, is, what there is to this, a chart that really tells you a lot about market dynamics. And this is a chart that shows the average hourly moves in the euro US dollar. Now, I don't care if it went up or down. I'm taking the absolute move. So if it moved up 50 pips, I take that as 50 pips. If it moved down 50 pips, I'll take that as 50 pips. And I've plotted the average hourly move in the year US dollar per hour of day in New York time. I'm sorry, it's not on the legend there this time. But this is New York time again. And what you're seeing is that through the US session, for instance, volatility is at its highest basically when the US session more or less begins. Volatility is at its highest of the day approximately at 9 Eastern time, actually a little bit before that because there's a lot of US economic data that comes out at 8.30 Eastern time. But basically, this is when volatility is at its highest. And earlier I mentioned, you know, this, this information is useful or is interesting in isolation, but unless you know why traders are on average losing money during a specific stretch, you don't know how to use it to improve your own trading. So again, volatility very high at the beginning of the US session. And there's a reason for this. The New York session starts at about 8, 9 Eastern time. The European session ends at about 11, 12 Eastern time. So when those two overlap, you're basically getting the bulk of the volatility of the day. And that's exactly what you're seeing. Past the hour of approximately 10 Eastern, US volatility starts dropping pretty significantly. Indeed, this is the Euro-US dollar pair. Shouldn't surprise you too much to note that mo uh, the biggest consistent volatility is actually through the European session. Again, European currency, European hours. Sure enough, you see fairly substantial moves through this session. And again, I really care about how much the currency is moving on an hourly basis because that could make a pretty big difference in terms of whether or not you're making or losing money given a specific trading strategy. Finally, the slowest hours of the day tends to be the Asian trading hours. That's the title of this, this seminar. That's the title of the trading during Asia hours. So as a bit of a spoiler, you know, we see the market conditions during Asia hours Market conditions are basically pretty quiet through the, the bulk of the Asian session. I mean, the overlap between the Asian session and the Euro session can see some pretty sharp European uh, Euro US dollar moves. But for the most part, the average currency move is actually relatively small compared to especially European and US hours. One thing I'll point out is that, that this intraday seasonality depends a lot on the currency pair. So, the dollar yen's volatility actually peaks a little bit earlier than it, what, than it does in the euro US dollar pair. The European session isn't as volatile overall as compared to the Asian trading session. Notice that the peak during the, the Asian open, which happens at around 20 Eastern, is actually higher than the peak during the European session. And we're talking about the US dollar against the Japanese yen pair. On the y-axis, we're talking about average currency moves. Again, absolute moves, not directional. And you're actually seeing pretty significant volatility during Asian trading hours. So you're starting to notice a couple of things here that really start to tie into a lot of what we've been talking about with volatility, with different market moves, and what it means for the average trader, given what we've already discussed, given the fact that we've already discussed the average trader tends to do poorly when markets are moving a lot. So what do we do when markets are moving a lot? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. I'm talking about the RSI again. I warned you. At, we were going to talk about the RSI all day. Here it is again, because again, I think it's a great proxy for what traders actually do. RSI, very simply, you buy something that's oversold, you sell something that's overbought. Right here, we have the RSI doing pretty well when markets aren't going anywhere. Fantastic. We're picking. Pretty good tops and bottoms, not perfectly, obviously, but for the most part, the euro is not really going anywhere. It's trending sl slightly higher. When it breaks down, however, the RSI strategy 
does very poorly. You would have bought because the RSI told us you were over, oversold down here. Unfortunately, you stayed oversold for a very long time, and you could have suffered pretty substantial losses. In fact, this is the equity curve of the RSI trading strategy with the Euro US dollar pair dating back to about 2002. Hypothet uh, I'll go over the hypothetical performance a little bit again. You know, well, this is terrible, so benefit of hindsight, sure, but I'm basically showing how bad it is. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be bad. In fact, there are some actually pretty good winning streaks in there, and we'll talk about how to improve this. But even when we're talking about how to improve this, you want to keep in mind that something that's worked in the past isn't necessarily going to work in the future. Keep that squarely in mind, please. So let's go back to the RSI strategy. And again, does well when markets aren't doing anything, does poorly when markets break out. What do we do? In light of the fact, I mean, the, the, the title of the presentation should tell you everything, trading during Asia hours, we're going to put a new filter on our RSI strategy with the Euro dollar pair in particular because there are these intraday seasonality trends because on average, the Euro dollar tends to move less during the off hours, which in European and US hours are the Asian trading hours. We're going to put a filter on there that the strategy cannot enter new positions unless we're in between our start time and end time. And that means that I'm going to limit my trading in the RSI trading system. This is on a 60-minute Euro-US dollar chart. I'm going to limit my trading in the RSI trading system if the, tra if the trade triggers outside of my trading window. So let's see what that looks like. Again, you want to, given all we've discussed today about the RSI strategy, it's parallels to, to actual trader performance and when traders tend to do well, when range trading strategies tend to do well, you want to look for periods of low volatility. And that's pretty clear. If markets aren't going anywhere, you can sell something that's expensive because it's probably going to come back. Well, I'm going to start looking for these periods. And one of those troughs happens around midnight, Eastern time, when it, you're halfway through the Asian trading session and there's just not much going on, especially in the Euro-US dollar currency pair. Another trough might happen halfway through the European session. So already I'm, I'm trying to find these points where I might look to start trading and end trading on, on the RSI trading strategy, given the fact that I know that it's going to do poorly when markets are moving too much. Finally, there's one more trough here, and it's, it's the, the deepest one. This is kind of no man's land. When the US, US session ends, when stocks close at 4 Eastern time, Asia doesn't really open until 18 Eastern. So you're kind of in no man's land here, and actually a lot of institutional uh, shops would actually close trading at 4, open it up, back up at 5, just to give you a sense, nothing's really going on because no one's at their desk. It's a little too early for Asia, too late for the U.S., and Europe has long, long been asleep. So, I'm going to go back, actually I put the, the cart in front of the horse there a little bit. I'm trying to pick the periods in which we have the least volatility, and I'm going to, to shape my, my strategy around that. So what I'll do is, I'll start my trading at exactly 16 Eastern time, when volatility drops to its lowest, and I'll end it right around 0 Eastern time. And that's what that equity curve would look like. Now, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the Euro US dollar chart and how bad this equity curve was to begin with. This is the Ross RSI strategy. This is how poorly you would have done had you hypothetically traded it throughout this stretch. Let's go forward a few slides. And here we are with a very simple time-based filter. Now, I'll be the first to point out that since about 2008, it's been awful. But it's actually a pretty substantial improvement, in my opinion, given the fact that you know, the, the raw strategy did nothing but lose throughout that entire session. So we're off to a good start. Same, same disclaimer about hypothetical performance applies. But let's try to fine-tune this a little bit more. So instead of concentrating as, as a quant and as a back tester, I don't like concentrating on one currency pair. Why? Because when you do that, you, you run the risk of over-optimizing to what happened in that particular currency pair over that stretch of time. If I limit myself to the Euro-US dollar, it'll be like, okay, well, the system will 
probably work well on the euro dollar, but on the sterling dollar, dollar yen, it's probably going to be pretty terrible, at least in my experience. So what I want to see is consistency in the strategy performance over these few, few currency pairs to really know that or to think that I'm on to something. So here we have the R side trading strategy performance. We start with 10K in each strategy. For, or if we want to trade on one-to-one -one leverage, we're doing 10, 10K lots. On each of these currency pairs, we're tra trading a 14-period RSI on a 60-minute chart on each of these currency pairs. And this is the equity curve for those three currency pairs dating back to 2002. It's terrible. There's no sugarcoating it. I mean, there are some periods in which it does decently well, but those are few and far between. And overall, the strategy does extraordinarily poorly. Let's start to think about our time filters. So we talked about European trading hours and how they were the most volatile. Let's avoid them altogether. Let's just limit ourselves to Asian trading hours, purely Asian trading hours, 17 Eastern to about 3 Eastern, the 3 in the morning. That's the equity curve for that. That's a substantial improvement. And again, it hasn't done well at all since about 2006. But you know, compared to the baseline, I mean, this strategy is phenomenal, considering that the baseline strategy lost theoretically $30,000 over that stretch. We're still losing here, but it's a much smaller loser. We might be onto something. All right, so let's fine tune it a little bit here. So instead of exactly you know, the, the US close, and, and again, that period of, of about 16 to about 18 Eastern is, is kind of no man's land. Not too many people are trading the hour of least liquidity in the trading day. I'm actually going to limit myself to basically a little bit beyond the, I'm going to miss the, the initial volatility of the Asian trading open. And I'm going to limit myself to 20 Eastern time and 3 in the morning. All right. It's a Better improvement. So the baseline's down here again. Blue line, pretty terrible. 17 to 3 a.m. It's a little bit better, still pretty bad. Now we're, we're getting to the point that, okay, we might be onto something here. The red line shows what would have happened if we only allowed our system to trade between the hours of 20 Eastern and 3 a.m. All of a sudden, we were seeing positive equity at the end. It's a good, we're heading in the right direction. Let's keep going. Actually, as it turns out, you know, hindsight being 2020, obviously, I want to find the best combination. The best combination for these three currency pairs turns out to be 2 p.m. Eastern time to about 6 a.m. Eastern time, which in, in you know, West, West, or, um, Pacific time, 11 to um, 2 p.m.? Yep, no. Yes, exactly. Uh, or 3 a.m., sorry. And what we're seeing here is a pretty substantial improvement, in my opinion. And, you know, given the fact that I've been talking about the RSI all day, you know, we could add a couple other filters or we could improve this strategy's performance a couple of different ways. But just purely limiting ourselves to specific trading hours, and all of a sudden we're seeing significant improvements in that strategy's performance. We get even a little bit better. Actually, I said it was, I misspoke. I said four, 2 p.m. earlier. The best equity curve happens from 14 Eastern to 6 a.m. Eastern time. And that's the purple line right there. It has the, the best final equity curve, and it does seem to have better risk adjusted returns. I think the 2010, 2009 to 2010 just emphasizes this point. So you're seeing right here that. Because the euro and the sterling were so bad through this stretch, the raw strategy did really poorly. And even our filtered strategy did really poorly. All of a sudden, when you start adding this filter, it's actually not half bad. Hindsight being 2020, of course. But at the same time, you do see a significant pickup in performance. So let's go a little bit further. And this chart is a little bit confusing. I'll explain it the best I can. So I talk a lot about optimization, and I want to know the absolute best combination of start time and end time. This is a, and it's difficult to show a 3D chart on a 2D medium, but basically I have my start times, all of my possible start times on this axis right here, end times over here, and something we discussed earlier, return on account with 
basically comparing final equity over the maximum drawdown, that peak happens to, to occur right around the 14 o'clock Eastern time to 6 a.m. Eastern time. And in the Euro US dollar alone, you know, if I flip back a few slides, you see how bad that equity curve was to begin with. But all of a sudden, when we only allow ourselves to trade in some of the quietest trading hours of the day, in this range trading strategy, you start to see a pretty significant improvement in performance in the Euro US dollar. We're going back to that chart. Why might, why might that be the case? I mean, I'll admit that the, the 2 p.m. mark might be a little bit cherry-picked, might not be the best going forward, but at the same time, it's pretty close to the lull in volatility for the day. You know, uh, the absolute lull in euro US dollar volatility happens at the, the New York Stock Exchange close at 16 Eastern. Our best optimized time is at 14, not far away. And all of a sudden, we, we see that we're limiting ourselves to 14 Eastern time, this dot right here, to 6 a.m. Eastern, which gives us okay amounts of volatility, but we miss the bulk of volatility that happens right in the Europe-US crossover up here. We are trading halfway through the European session, but we are missing the biggest moves of the day. And in fact, notice that we're mostly trading during Asia trading hours. This is trading the euro US dollar on the RSI strategy only between the hours of approximately 2 p.m. Eastern to 6 a.m. Eastern. Now, what I need to point out is that trading this seasonality-based strategy during Asia trading hours isn't necessarily the best idea across the board. Why? Because I emphasized earlier, if the dollar yen, given that it's an Asia-centric currency, obviously, Tokyo is, is, well, Tokyo is the center of forex trading in, in the, uh, the eastern world, the eastern part of the world. It tends to see less volatility during the U.S. session and relatively less volatility during the European session, but it sees the bulk of its big moves during the Asia session. So if we follow the same idea, it might not work as well, and it's really important to keep in mind that if you're trying to limit yourself to lower volatility periods of the day, you probably want to avoid trading Asia-Pacific Asia currency pairs through the Asian session. Sure enough, the same back test. So the baseline RSI strategy on the dollar yen, Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, and the sterling yen, and the sterling yen I put in there because it's one of the more popular currency pairs that our own clients trade, the baseline is awful. You can see that much. Uh, I apologize that this is in scientific notation, but it was so bad that it didn't even know how to treat the negative 100,000 mark. But the blue line is the baseline, and you're seeing that even when we do put those filters on it, it's pretty bad. There is some hope that the 20, 20 Eastern to 3 a.m. Eastern does hold some hope since 2008, but I wouldn't hang my hat on that result. I mean, again, we're, we're doing stuff with the benefit of hindsight. With the benefit of hindsight, I might look at something, I might look for something that at least looks a little, little bit better than that and has a better chance of success overall. I want to bring it back to our initial chart. Again, I've talk, been talking RSI all day, not because I'm, I'm in love with the indicator. Actually, I don't tend to use it in my own trading, to be perfectly honest with you. But what I will tell you is that I see remarkable similarities between what the RSI does, and it's a range trading strategy. It sells when something's high, buys when something's low. It tends to do pretty poorly at the same times that our traders do. So while we look at how our traders are doing during specific points in time, we see that the majority of traders tend to do the worst. If you have an open position, most traders are losing money on those open positions through the bulk of the volatility in the day. And actually, during the Asian trading hours, the majority of traders are actually making money on that position. So at the end of the day, if you understand the why, and the why, again, is, is volatility. The fact that currencies, on average, move a lot during those hours, and our traders tend to do poorly, you know to avoid those hours with those specific trading strategies. So in sum, you know, recognize the trading style. If you fit the molds, if you do the same thing, if you sell when it's expensive, buy when it's cheap, sell at resistance, buy at support, 
you're probably going to do poorly when markets are moving a lot because they will break through support, it will break through resistance. And the RSI strategy in this particular case, as the proxy for the average trader, will tend to do poorly. Recognize that trading style. Adapt to changing market conditions. And I've said this again. I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. If you know that markets are going to move a lot, and this, I think, works in conjunction with what I was saying earlier about using the RSI trading strategy with volatility filters, this is just another volatility filter. If we know that, on average, the euro, the sterling, the, the Swiss franc tend to move the most during European hours, avoid the bulk of that session. Avoid the, the, the crossover between London and New York because you might stand to lose big when that, that currency pair starts breaking resistance, making new highs, making new lows, breaking support. Range trading, avoid certain hours of the day. Breakout trading, and I cover that a little bit more in our, our, our trading the measures during active hours. Avoid the slowest moving hours of the day. I think, you know, in sum, I, like I mentioned earlier, I, I really like the series. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I spent a lot of time in these presentations today, but I really like looking at this in sum. Understanding that the hard facts are a little tough to look at. You know, when you look at that first chart that I showed, and I've showed it five times today, the fact that on average, more traders are losing than those are winning, that's a pretty sobering fact. But at the same time, you know, you want to use that information and you want to try to understand the why and then the how on how to improve your own trading style so you're not part of the herd, so you're not, you know, basically stampeding into the slaughterhouse to use a pretty drastic analogy, and you understand the why, how you might improve your trading style. In this case, it was avoiding the most active hours of the day. Earlier, we were avoiding the most active days of the month or, you know, most active days overall. And really, I think these are complementary. So the first presentation today was about good money management. So understanding that if you're making a lot of profitable trades, you want to limit yourself to risking as much as you have to lose. Reward to risk ratios are at least one to one. Later on, I talked about leverage and different examples on, on what might work in different market conditions. And this is just another piece of that puzzle. So I thank you all very much for uh, sticking it out with me, especially those who have been here all day. I see a number of faces. Uh, it's been a long day for me, but I can only imagine it's hard to keep your you're, you're focused on all day, and I, and I try to mix it up for you. But really, you know, I, I really enjoy the, the material that I, that I presented today, and, and it's, it's not hard for me to stay up here and talk about it. Because when you do see those numbers, it's tough to digest as someone who writes about this stuff for a living, who studies this stuff for a living. You know, am I sending a herd to the slaughterhouse? That's not how I want to think about what I'm doing. So if I can tell you that the herd is doing this wrong, and you improve your chances of success, and I can't guarantee that you'll make money. A lot of this is just going to depend on whether or not you're built um, for this. And it's the kind of thing where you're in this to make money. Again, I've said it 10 times today, but if you're in it for the thrill, you got free cocktails at the craps table, and it's probably a little more exciting. So in sum, I really hope you got a lot out of this. And you know, if there's any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them now. I thank you again, and you know, Good luck trading.